and going to college uh, as the first person in my family that went to college in the U.S. thinking, you know, this piece of paper guarantees me a job or an opportunity. And as a bachelor's degree, it really didn't. You had people with like doctorate degrees working at, um, at Starbucks during that time. So I couldn't find a job anywhere. And the only thing that really kind of kept me sane was going to the gym, exercising. That was kind of my me place, my place to kind of clear my mind, get a, you know, kind of level headed. And then I, you know, started a cup uh, up a conversation with someone and they basically said one day, come out to my car. Uh, I want to give you something that can help. Obviously, that could have went in, in different directions. And I think that's when you have to kind of certain situations let opportunity in because you don't know how you're going to be blessed oftentimes in life things are packaged in different ways that are you know blessings and opportunities that you should take advantage of welcome to my podcast become the content will inspire you to take steps towards reaching your aspirations and becoming the best version of yourself I feature interviews with successful individuals from various industries delving into their personal and professional journeys and their strategies to achieve their goals. We have to become the person we are meant to be so we can live the life we are destined to live. That means we must overcome challenges and work through difficult times to learn, grow and become the more incredible version of ourselves. I'm so glad that you're here. Let's get on this journey together. My guest today is Roman Prokopchak, and his why not attitude led him to start his own business, which was totally different from the secret service career path he wanted. Roman shares his journey as a first-generation Ukrainian building a life here in the U.S. and how overcoming personal and business challenges turned into opportunity. Join our conversation as he explains the ties to his Ukrainian family and getting over six miscarriages that he and his wife had to endure before becoming foster parents. Today, I have the blessing to have Roman Prokopchak here. He is the first generation immigrant from Ukraine. He arrived in the US with six other family members to a two bedroom apartment. Roman interned with the Secret Service and held a top secret government clearance. He founded Nova Zora Digital in 2012. Roman is also the host of the Digital Savage Experience. Experience podcast. Well, welcome, Roman. How are you today? I'm good. Thank you for having me on. We just recently met at the Podfest Expo, where we both attended, and I really was so touched by your story. Being the first generation uh, from the Ukraine, And you came here, I think you were five years old. Do you still remember anything? And what was your experience or your memories? You know, my family left because of religious persecution. Uh, Ukraine was still under the Soviet Union. So, you know, there's a lot of memories, a lot of family memories where I lived, kind of where I played. Uh, and you, you'd be surprised, obviously, how powerful memories are later. Certain things just kind of pop up from the subconscious because you know in terms of a human if we have all that there and it's not compacted it's it's a lot to process but kind of the brain's a powerful thing oh yeah so so powerful and did you have a hard time to adapt to this new culture here in the u.s i think my parents and grandparents and aunt had a harder time because i was a you know, a kid. And if obviously you learn a language before a certain age, you don't retain the accent. So, you know, right when I came over, you know, I went right into uh, kindergarten and kind of had classes in terms of England's second language. So kindergarten and first grade, I had English second language classes. And if everybody surrounding you speak speaking English, it's easier to pick it up. And then I kind of like tested out of that within a year and a half. My uh, parents and grandparents and aunt went to night school for English. Obviously, they still uh, have accents because they learn English as adults or any language you learn, you know, you kind of retain an accent. With what's going on right now, the war in the Ukraine, I believe you still have family there. So what does that whole situation right now 
Uh, what kind of feelings are attached with that for you? Yeah, I have uh, right now five family members in the Ukrainian military. So three have been uh, fighting since the beginning uh, of the war. Well, if you want to go back, I consider the beginning was 2014, even though Russia said it was, mm -hmm. you know, uh, separatists for independence. They were pushing that and obviously the annexation of Crimea. But um, they've been since last February fighting and two more were called up and um, uh, I guess a, a, a draft or however you want to call it. Uh, one of my family members had their house blown up a few weeks ago in an airstrike when they started like conducting airstrikes uh, fairly regularly in an amplified kind of, um, I guess, interval. Um, and it's sometimes hard to reach them because, you know, civilian infrastructure, uh, electricity, phone lines, uh, Internet have been you know hit in a lot of parts of the country so sometimes you can't reach people for a few days but uh you know luckily everyone currently is still okay safe or as safe as they can be when you know we can reach somebody that are in the military they can't really say much and talk can't really talk mm -hmm. but um you know i'm from Lviv, which is right by poland it's a unesco world heritage site and russia often says that's where like the quote unquote like patriotic uprising start and it's a very like nationalistic uh area like pride in ukraine and the ukrainian language so in terms of history we have not been uh pro-russia and we've seen the kind of stuff you know the soviet union the russian federation the russian empire has done to ukrainians things like you know artificial famines like the holodomor in the 30s that killed millions of ukrainians and that's what kind of created this ethnic situation in uh, luhansk and donetsk that's where those people were killed off primarily because all the food was taken out and they were starved to death and then uh you know stalin settled uh ethnic russians in the area so there's that kind of dynamic so that's kind of one reason yeah. where a lot of stuff was going on. But there's, you know, this I, I don't hate Russian people. There's plenty of good Russian people. But just kind of the mindset and the brainwashing of a lot of the population and, you know, the leadership. I think if you go back to all the way to like Ivan the Terrible, it's always been leaders that didn't necessarily care for their people. It's just kind of rule, a rule with like an iron fist. People were often oppressed. And, and unfortunately, that's all I guess the Russian population has, has known throughout the Soviet Union and the Russian Empire for hundreds of years. So maybe that mindset is tough to get off and, and obviously break through. My thoughts and prayers are going out, obviously, to your family and all to the Ukrainians and, and people that, that, that have the bravery and, and fight and stand up against those, quote unquote, rulers that suppress human beings. But let's change the subject to something that you experienced here in your life, because uh, there are also other things that has nothing to do with, with wars or suppression, but still is very, very hard on your personal life. And that is that you and your wife went through like a lot of miscarriages that at the end led you to become foster parents. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So we, we got married and, you know, decided to obviously start a family and um, kind of went in to uh, see kind of where we stand, uh, you know, genetically, both of us and kind of get tested genetically also to see if there's any, you know, precursors because you may have like a, a marker that's dormant, but if you, you know, have a spouse that if you, you know, choose to, you know, uh, have a baby when those like, you know, uh, that DNA is combined, it activates that, I guess, recessive gene and can potentially lead to, you know, health issues or conditions and stuff like that. So we just wanted to kind of make sure. And my wife knew before that she had endo, uh, endometriosis, which makes it tougher for, you know, her to get pregnant. So we started kind of on an infertility journey, at which at this point, we probably spend $100,000 out of pocket for all the treatments and stuff. And, um, you know, we had an wow. embryo transfer or uh, uh, embryo or egg retrieval where they took the eggs and then they, you know, made embryos and, uh, you know, 
I guess, froze them and, and kind of genetically qualified them in terms of likelihood to, you know, develop to full term and, you know, be a healthy pregnancy. And we had uh, IVFs and IUIs in terms of the um, basically embryo transfers. And like you mentioned, we ex- experienced in about three to four years, uh, six miscarriages, two of which happened on Christmas days, which is uh, a weird connotation to wow. carry over for basically the rest of your life in terms of kind of a happy day now has like a shadow over it. But, um, mm-hmm. you know, in, I would say, uh, in, in between of that, we thought, you know, potentially we looked at straight adoption, but at that point, a lot of adoptions are like forty, fifty thousand $50,000 out of pocket. And since we, we spent, you know, well over a hundred thousand dollars, that wasn't necessarily an option in terms of what we, what we can afford. So, uh, we went to, a uh, uh, orientation session, uh, within our county in New Jersey in terms of kind of what it means to be a foster parent, what to kind of like expect. And we decided to go on that kind of journey, which took about 10 months to uh, be licensed both individually and have your home because, you know, you get a license for you and then where you live to make sure it's safe, how many potential kids you can have in your home, that kind of thing. And, um, you know, basically we decided to to go on that journey and technically we're, uh, we're uh, classified as foster to adopt. So if a uh, child is in your home and uh, parental rights are terminated, the state would be coming to you first and asking if it's a good fit. And obviously if the child is old enough, they have a say in, you know, if they would like to be adopted by that family. We went on and we went on that journey, obviously together. May thirty first of twenty eighteen, we were licensed, and next day we had two boys, basically, two brothers, dropped off on our doorstep, and uh, kind of like here, here you go, figure it out. And four years later, and uh, twenty nine kids later, we're still kind of uh, chugging along. Wow, I wonder how that um, affects you when you get to know a child so very well, and all of a sudden. You have to basically let it um, let it go. You, how, how do you deal with that? Yeah, so you have to be somewhat of, a, I guess, like like an emotional masochist, if you will, because you know it's coming. Because you know you you gain an attachment to to every child, whether they're in your home for a few days or a few months or a few years. You know, uh, twenty seven have gone home or to relatives or to a, a different situation and. We had, you know, one child we have currently, he went back home and unfortunately, same thing he experienced. He was put back in the system and was placed with us again. So pretty much for about half of his life, he's been with us, uh, our longest placement. And uh, how old is he? He's uh, he's five. He'll be six in um, in August. But he's been with us since he was, uh, you know, a little over two. And he went home Mm -hmm. literally for six weeks and was put back in the system and the uh the toddler now a toddler i still consider him a baby but we had since straight from the hospital so he was um born four pounds he was in a NICU for two weeks basically the first week he was detoxing they didn't think he was gonna make it because his mom walked in the hospital complaining of a stomach ache she didn't even know she was pregnant and he was like basically like hanging out of her ready to come out so oh my gosh uh you know thank god he's like really intuitive really smart child um he's there's thank god no uh developmental delays that we've seen he's very inquisitive and learning quickly and and talking well so he's technically now in the adoption unit because the mom had her uh rights terminated he has five other siblings that she had parental rights terminated and um they were adopted and he's basically moving through the adoption process. So hopefully within two to three months of this interview where, you know, we formally adopt him. What piece of advice would you give someone who goes through such an emotional roller coaster that you and your wife did? How did you best deal with that? Uh, I feel like being there for the other person. So like, I would say if you're experiencing something like that with someone else, if it's two people, like kind of being on the same page and, and kind of being open about what you're feeling, because me, how I, what I felt was a little different because the, the miscarriage obviously is affecting my wife's body too. So she has that kind of uh, additional trauma. So 
for me personally, it was one of those things like uh, being there, kind of feeling guilty, kind of feeling like I'm not necessarily like offering much in terms of, um, you know, coping or like, you know, uh, a healing process because I, I can't, I can't relate to what's happened to her body. Like I'm there as, um, what word can I even use as, um, as part of it, but I'm not like bearing the brunt of it. So figuring mm -hmm. out kind of like, you know, how I can actually help if there's something specific, just talking through it because, you know, experiencing one is, I guess, impactful and traumatic enough, but going through, through six is even, you know, you get to a point where you're like almost numb and the sixth hurt, but we already had during the sixth, we are, we already were fostering. So we had the baby with us, which she's now a toddler. Mm -hmm. So I think it didn't hurt less, but it was more culpable because, you know, we had kids in our home. So it's like, all right, get up. Yeah. You can't feel like that because you have, you know, him and other kids that are depending on you and obviously bringing right. you a level of joy and, and comfort and, and love in that sense. So I guess what is that so true? Yeah, so true. When you have other human beings surrounding you and focusing on them. I would like to shift gears here to your business. You mentioned that you were in secret service and you kind of are forced to start your own business. If you can give us just a little bit of your experience while you're forced to start your entrepreneurial journey and how it really changed your life. Yeah. So even, I guess, before that, I, um, I was going to go, like I sh I've shared it before, I was going to go to the Marine Corps as a Marine Corps officer. So if you're in the U.S., if you're, um, you know, going to, to college, if you're in college, uh, you can uh, go and, and go and get a commission. So you don't go in as enlisted. If you get a bachelor's degree, you go to Quantico, Virginia, train, and you get a commission as a, a second lieutenant. So my junior year of college, that was kind of the dire direction, but I ended up getting sick. And I guess it's a blessing in disguise. Like I think if I went to the training, I probably would have died based on like I had a this ulcer like bleeding inside. Mm. It was caused by like a bacteria specifically. Um, and I got that resolved and I, you know, found out about it. But uh, yeah, yeah, the, 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 it was the military or like my, my major was criminal justice. So my last semester I interned with the secret service on the counterfeit currency squad. I saw that was like a cool opportunity. It's something that interested me, kind of federal law enforcement, either like uh, secret service, NSA, FBI, uh, CIA, that kind of level. But then, uh, as I mentioned before, the economy tank. So, you know, government kind of really ceased uh, hiring and froze kind of spending uh, somewhat. So state, local, federal agencies stopped hiring. So for months and months, I was kind of like down. Uh, it's one of those things where I guess you get a little prideful or you start expecting things, like especially in the U.S., where everything is um, you're kind of in a safety net, uh, you know, in the world in a way. And going to college uh, as the first person in my family that went to college in the U.S. thinking, you know, this piece of paper guarantees me a job or an opportunity. <laughs> and as a bachelor's degree, it really didn't. You had people with like doctorate degrees working at, um, at Starbucks during that time. Let me hop in here real quick to share something with you. Have you ever tried to build your own website, start a newsletter or build a course and charge for it? Have you ever wanted to make money online but are totally confused by all the different systems you need to have? That's why I use Kajabi. Kajabi is the most popular system for online marketers, coaches, thought leaders and influencers. Kajabi helps online entrepreneurs take off. Over hundred thousands of us use Kajabi and have made over four billion dollars. Why not be part of it? The best thing is you don't have to figure out tons of systems or crazy technology to start your online business. Kajabi helps you do all of that and it's all on one platform. That's why I use it. It makes my life so much easier and I can even earn money while I'm sleeping. You can build your web pages, blogs, and membership sites. You can create offers, checkout pages, and collect money. 
You can host your videos. You can start your newsletter list, capture emails, start your marketing funnels all in one place. It makes it fun and easy with awesome tutorials and support. Since I've joined Kajabi from the beginning, I have a special affiliate link that I would like to share with you. A 30-day free trial. So nothing to lose, but everything to gain. Just go to my link that's in the show notes, sabinekvenberg.com forward slash resources, and we will redirect you to the free trial page. And if you are just starting out and want to get your offer out for sale in just three days, let me help you do that. Visit my webpage, by the way, that I built on Kajabi, and apply to making it happen. So now let's get back to the show. So I couldn't find a job anywhere. And the only thing that really kind of kept me sane was going to the gym, exercising. That was kind of my me place, my place to kind of clear my mind, get a, you know, kind of level headed. And then I, you know, started a couple, uh, up a conversation with someone and they basically said one day, come out to my car. Uh, I want to give you something that can help. Obviously that could have went in, in different directions. And I think that's when you have to kind of certain situations let opportunity in because you don't know how you're going to be blessed. Oftentimes in life, things are packaged in different ways that are, you know, blessings and opportunities that you should take advantage of because if you don't, you know, they can, they can or will in a lot of instances lead to kind of greater things. And I said, kind of why not? And then they basically I went outside, they handed me a packet about search engine optimization, and they said, you know, read this packet, take another month or two, and you can start doing that for uh, our business. And that kind of got my foot in the door in terms of experience, and which I've been doing since 2008, so going on, you know, 15-ish ish years. And I wouldn't have gotten that opportunity or, you know, founding a company around that in 2012 if I didn't, you know, just say why not and and were, was open to something that was kind of outside of my comfort level mm-hmm. why not that's i love that why not and then going outside your comfort level that can propel you to so many new opportunities and i guess as you said it was a blessing in disguise roman thank you so much for sharing your journey and sharing with our listeners, you know, also the hard time that you went through on a professional and personal level, and that there's always a silver lining. There's always, uh, when you look for it, the turn of events that actually brings you to a better life and also turns you to your next greater self. So how can people get in touch with you if they want to learn more about what you do? Yeah, I'm on, uh, I think, every social media platform at this point. So Roman Prokopchuk, obviously the last name's a little challenging, but you'll find me. Uh, the podcast is the uh, Digital Savage Experience. If you search for that, you can find that on a player, the website, and the um, the digital marketing agency is Nova Zora Digital. And I will make sure that all your contact information will be in the show notes. So thank you so much for stopping by and doing this chat with me. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. That was my interview. And if you enjoyed it, give us a five-star review, leave a comment and share it with your friends. Thanks for listening. Until I see you again, always remember, serve from the heart, follow your passion and live the life you imagined.